right, everybody. Welcome to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us. Retired NASA and NOAA scientist, author of the book Cold Sun, Dark Winter, and his latest uh, that was released this last December, Upheaval. John, how you doing tonight? We're just fine, Jake. Uh, thanks for having me on. John, this has been a long time coming. We were uh, reached out to you weeks ago. We're, we are very excited to have you on our channel. Um, I mentioned in our communication that we consider uh, your work as a foundation and beyond for our channel. We're thrilled to have you here and it's an honor. Thanks again for being here. Glad to be here. All and right. thank you for all the work you and Laura have been doing. Uh, it's great to see uh, your focus on the next grand solar minimum. I wish there were more people like you and Mari helping get the message out. It's it's growing. I can tell you that the results right now are tremendous. There are more people engaging in our community about this than there was, say, four weeks ago. So, yes, um, yes that that's our main goal here at this channel. We want to work with everybody that's on this topic. Um, okay, so I'd like to ask a few questions here, John. And I know you've probably been asked these quite a bit. Uh, the first one I wanted to ask you was, when will it be obvious that a new cold epoch has arrived as predicted in your book, Dark Winter? Well, actually, it's already obvious to a lot of people on the planet. Uh, regrettably, the uh, media uh, still uh, does not tell what's happening uh, to the extent that they're still pushing the man-made global warming story. But uh, if you were in uh, Great Britain in February, you would already know that the next cold epoch has begun because all of a sudden you've been told that uh, cold weather has killed much of the vegetable crop and you can't uh, get lettuce or cucumbers in your grocery store. And in fact, there are actually people fighting over vegetables in Great Britain grocery stores uh, in February because of the cold weather Europe was getting. So over there, uh, a lot of people may feel uh, that it's already started to hit. Um, uh, on the other side of the planet, uh, uh, the capital of Australia, Canberra, where my director of research for our earthquake uh, research company is, said they just set new cold weather records down in Australia. So uh, it depends on where you live, but certainly here in the U.S. we're still dominated uh, by the media and the government, uh, or at least the previous government, uh, telling us uh, something about the climate that's uh, probably not accurate. Uh, more specifically, uh, to know that the next cold epoch has hit uh, with certainty will come, in fact, when we have that first uh, bitter cold winter that lasts until spring and destroys our uh, food supply to a large percentage. Uh, we did have losses this spring but uh, the media hasn't discussed uh, much of that. Uh, so uh, the short answer is uh, when things start to disappear in the grocery store and the supermarket uh, because of cold weather damage, then probably people will stand up and say, what's going on? I thought everything was supposed to be getting warmer, not colder. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the media not t communicating. We've done several updates that we have little, you know, two, three minute clips that we show. And a lot of the stuff that we report on is not in the mainstream media. You really have to dig to find some of these, you know, freak hailstorms. You talk about South Australia setting cold records. I got an email from a gentleman who lives in New Zealand right now. And I guess they hit minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's pretty cold for them at this point in their winter. They think their winter's five to six weeks earlier than what it's supposed to. So there is evidence of the, what you just said here all over. Your comment about New Zealand, uh, one of the uh, big myths that we keep hearing about is the fact that uh, glaciers all over the planet are shrinking and, and will disappear. Uh, New Zealand's, uh, I think, got 26 major glaciers, and they're all growing at the fastest rate they've recorded uh, in the modern satellite era. So again, who knows about that here in the U.S.? No one, because the mainstream media won't discuss it. Right, exactly. 
All right. Uh, another question I had for you as well. Uh, what is the current status of the Earth's temperature, and can we trust what the government is telling us? Uh, the current status is that we've just come off a peak of warming in the 2015-2016 period. But as I predicted in early 2016, uh, this would be the last such warm spike in global temperatures that we will have probably for the next 400 years. Since uh, early 2016, uh, global temperatures have continued to drop. We had another very steep drop in June, from May to June. I believe in May we had an anomaly of 0 0.43, and um, it went to 0 0.26, so a big drop uh, from May to June. And I expect this uh, drop in temperatures to continue and to be essentially unabated until we get to the uh, 2040s. So uh, we'll certainly see ups and downs. Uh, weather uh, and climate uh, do overlap on a yearly basis uh, and every two years. So you will see uh, variations, ups and downs that are quite rapid and, and large. But uh, we're on the downside of the 206-year solar cycle. There's nothing mankind can, can do about it. Uh, we'll just uh, have to uh, recognize that global temperatures are going to continue to drop. So that's the current status. Uh, right now, we are, if you uh, look at a straight line graph, there's been effectively little to no change in global temperature for 20 years now. Prediction was uh, made in April. I posted that online. The prediction said two things. It said global temperatures would drop over the uh, next year, uh, which they have done exactly as I predicted. But I also said that uh, the spike in temperatures, which was produced by a spike in solar heating, nothing else but solar heating, uh, was uh, probably going to be the warmest that the human species, our, our peoples, will see for probably 400 years. The reason for the 400 years is the 206-year cycle. We're now going up and we're peaking and we're heading down rapidly. Uh, and, and when we come out of this, uh, and then head back up and start warming up. It'll be in the 2040s. But even after that, we won't get very warm. So it'll be at least two cycles of 206 years, so 412 years before we see any significant warming again. And quite frankly, that far out, you see other major solar cycles at right. play. Uh, and... Uh, the analysis isn't done on those. Some people are looking at those cycles, uh, but it could be that uh, even after 400 years, it'll only get much colder. Some are predicting a Maunder class minimum. What are your thoughts? Also, what is the time frame to reach that point? And could you expand on the last Maunder minimum and how that affected civilization? Uh, right. The uh, first part of your question is how soon and will we get down to a Maunder class solar minimum? Uh, there are many who believe we are heading into a new little ice age, which in terms of the Maunder minimum refers to the period of time when the sun had, had dropped in intensity and was the coldest period of the so-called little ice age. That was uh, 1615 to 1745 specifically. That's the Maunder minimum. And uh, that was a period of time when uh, New York Harbor froze over and stayed froze over. The Thames River stayed froze over. The Baltic Sea stayed frozen over. Uh, countries, uh, people could go from country to country across the frozen Baltic Sea. And it was so cold and the ice was so thick that they actually built hotels and shops uh, and other facilities out on the ice for travelers that were going back and forth between countries uh, over the frozen Baltic Sea. That's how bitterly cold it was. And of course, during this period of time, we had some of the world's greatest uh, warfare or battles going on. Uh, starvation was common. Uh, uh, famine and plague were common. Uh, illness was everywhere life expectancy dropped dramatically. Uh, 
there are a number of very good books written on this uh, period of time, and I recommend anyone that wants to do so uh, just research uh, the Maunder Minimum and that period of history, uh, especially European history, and you'll see how difficult life was, how crops routinely failed, uh, people starved to death. It was not a good time to be alive. Um, and unfortunately, our Russian colleagues are totally convinced uh, that we are heading into a little ice age again, like we were in the Maunder Minimum from 1615 to 1745. Uh, my, uh, my own research says we are uh, not heading that deep, but it'll be bad enough. We believe we'll be uh, seeing not a Maunder minimum, but a Dalton minimum, which lasted from 1793 to 1830. That was pretty bad. That was pretty cold. Uh, rampant warfare uh, existed throughout Europe during that period of time. The War of 1812 struck here in the U.S. So uh, there was lots of warfare, lots of famine, lots of death and destruction from the collateral effects of war, but also you had this bitter cold that had descended on the planet, not as cold as the Maunder minimum, but certainly bad enough to destroy crops. And lest we forget, in 1816 here in the United States, the so-called year without a summer, we literally had no summer in the New England states. Wow. We had snow and freezing rain in the dead of summer in August of, in 1816, you know, and I've reached out to local meteorologists back home from where I'm from in southwest Ohio. And, you know, it, we go back to talking about how the media doesn't really talk about what's happening. And I, I wanted to pick his brain about what he thought was the, um, you know, what was going to happen with this next upcoming minimum. And this is the same answer that I've gotten from most mainstream media is that there's, you know, the CO2 is going to, um, you know, overturn this whole thing. And that leads right. me to my next question. What is the truth about CO2 and its impact on the climate change? Well, of course, that's been the, uh, the grand theory. It is a grand myth, in my opinion, and that of many other researchers, that CO2 is the primary driver of climate change on Earth. There's simply no serious science that supports that contention. What we do have coming out of the United Nations, however, are uh, lots of bogus myths and bogus science uh, the climate gate scandal showed very clearly that the scientists at the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change were falsifying the data, were hiding the data that showed the planet was actually cooling in a number of years. Uh, and we also have coming out of that group, echoed during the Obama years, uh, many, many models of uh, climate uh, that were developed costing billions of dollars. And what we now know is those models were in error by 200, 300, or more percent. Goodness. Uh, these models are absolutely worthless from a scientific standpoint. Unfortunately, again, the mainstream media uses the output of these uh, very poorly constructed models and the extreme predictions for sea level rise and global temperature rise by the year 2100 as the basis for political action and social action here in our country. It's very sad that bad science has taken over in the media and uh, during the Obama years in our own government. Yeah, I don't understand what the sense of not exploring this and making it a topic of awareness throughout. Um, since I've been researching the grand solar minimum with solar uh, sunspots, how CO2 does not drive our climate. So it's... it's well, the... I didn't answer your question and I apologize. Uh, uh, but aside from the models and the UN uh, climate reports that are all based on mankind's CO2, uh, probably is aware of this, that CO2 is actually a trace gas that is such a very small component of the atmosphere that it has very little to do with climate. Uh, does mankind contribute to CO2? Yes. Does it have any kind of warming effect? Yes. But in the grand scheme of things, it is a very, very small component of global temperature. Clearly, the sun is overwhelmingly uh, the central source and the most powerful force in the solar system for driving the temperature here on Earth. 
CO2 produced by mankind is at best only 5% of naturally produced CO2. Right. So again, all the numbers show that CO2 cannot be the primary driver that the uh, falsified, manipulated reports out of the UN have been showing for more than three decades now. Very sadly, it's all bad science. Yes, agreed. Recently, we saw a ice shelf break off at Larson Sea, and it leads me into this next question. Uh, yes. What is the status of sea level rise, and how bad is the threat? Uh, sea level rise is continuing, although the rate is slowing down. That's a very key uh, statement. The, uh, the man-made global warming community says as long as CO2 goes up, then sea levels will go up lockstep. Uh, there's some relationship, but again, a very small relationship. Sea levels rise and fall for a number of reasons. The primary reason is the heating of the oceans, which causes them to expand. Uh, our globe, as you can see behind me, primarily 71% water. And as that water heats up, it expands. So as long as the sun has been heating up for the past 200 years now, we have seen a gradually expanding, rising sea level. However, uh, Dr. Niels Axel Morner and a number of other experts on sea level and myself know very well that there's a cyclical pattern to sea level rise. Uh, and it occurs pretty much on the same cycles as the sun. As the sun warms the planet, sea level rises go up. And as the sun starts to cool and that cycle drops, then of course, we'll start to see sea levels drop as well. Uh, we had a, uh, a very important news conference, uh, August the 21st, I believe, 2014 in Miami. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, we indicated very clearly that sea level rise is a function of the sun and the heating of the oceans, and that uh, beginning no later than 2020, we would see uh, the rising sea levels start to abate. By some measurements, that's already begun. We indicated in that uh, press conference that uh, between 2014 and 2020, we would see the changes in sea levels st start to manifest themselves. Uh, there's also a big question about sea level rise, even though, again, these these fabricated, these falsified data sets that are being used uh, by very poorly constructed climate models at the UN say that we're just going to see more and more sea level rise uh, between now and 2100. Uh, history and actual measurements show that's not the case at all. Uh, whereas Al Gore is telling the world that Florida will be flooded with 21 feet more of sea level rise uh, between now and 2100. Uh, the reality is, if you use the gold standard for measuring sea level, that there's going to be very little sea level rise between now and 2100, even with the current rate of growth of CO2. Uh, there's a big disparity right now between the satellite measurements and the actual tidal gauges, which are the gold standard for measuring sea level. And these tidal gauges are all over the planet. Uh, the satellite measurements show a rapid growth in sea level rise, but the gold standard says, no, we're not seeing it at all. Instead of 3.2 millimeters per year, which the UN says we're seeing, uh, the reality is it's closer to 1.2 or even less uh, per year. That says that there's no uh, big concern whatsoever for future sea level rise, even with the current rate of warming. However, now that the sun has maxed out and is on its way down, the oceans will start to cool, and I believe in the 2030s and 2040s, we'll be right back to where we were during the Dalton minimum, where the sea levels dropping dramatically 20 to 25 centimeters uh, over the next uh, 15 to 20 years, getting us back to where we were in the year 1800 at the bottom of the Dalton minimum. So that's what we said in our news conference. Uh, but again, uh, the CO2, the global warming crowd, Al Gore and company, uh, all they're doing is talking about bad science, bad models, and scary predictions that aren't going to happen.
Yeah, you mentioned bad science, and the next question I had for you as well, um, I, I heard rumors last year that we would be an all-water event, that the caps, everything would be melted by 2017. Are the Arctic, Greenland, and Antarctic actually melting? The Antarctic and the Arctic, uh, just like all other natural phenomena, go through cycles. Right now, and for the last two years, the Arctic has been dropping in temperature. Arctic sea heights has been growing, and that's been the case with the Antarctic. Bear in mind that the Arctic and the Antarctic did see a large uh, spike in melting during the same time we had that spike in solar heating. That's exactly what we should have seen. And uh, for those who uh, looked at the documentary that was done on my book, Dark Winter, I actually showed in that video, which was produced in 2000, late 2014 and early 2015, that the sun was going to produce a spike in activity. And it ha happened exactly when I said it would. So again, uh, natural cycles are at play. Uh, we did see a lot of melting in the Arctic and the Antarctic. That's now turning back around. And uh, uh, if you look at the long-term picture in the Antarctic, there's been very little warming whatsoever uh, for over a hundred years now. Yeah. And in general, the Antarctic continues on a very slight cooling trend and has for decades. Uh, the Arctic is a little different. It's more subject to northern hemisphere uh, weather patterns and the polar vortex, which is nothing more than a uh, counterclockwise rotation of winds. Uh, the Arctic is not at all a monolithic uh, entity like the media would like you to believe. For example, uh, some areas of the Arctic have um, one meter of ice thickness, but other areas have five meters or 15 meters right. of ice thickness. So it's a very different uh, non-uniform area to study. Uh, so again, going back to the science, it's very different than what the media is telling you. Yeah, well, right my, now, both Antarctic and the Arctic are in a cooling trend, which is about two years long right now. My uh, my favorite headline so far this year about the Arctic was the uh, group of researchers who were going to uh, study the effects of global warming, and they get their ship stuck in ice and had to abandon the entire research project. So. That right there should have been the first red flag that uh, folks like yourself, you know, this is a serious uh, topic that should be raised, uh, awareness should be raised as well. Um, and I saw something uh, a couple days ago that really blew my mind. Uh, Megyn Kelly had asked uh, Vladimir Putin about uh, Trump's recent decision of pulling out of the Paris Treaty. And the look on his face was his eyebrows raised and he looked at her as if to say are you serious record snow in uh, russia and it's cold and rainy right now and, and that's all he had to say his his feeling about it was like are you serious uh, you know basically you know trump did the right thing and i guess where i'm going with this is why are so many other global leaders not following president trump's lead on getting out of the paris climate accord that happened in december of 2015 Several good reasons for why they aren't. Uh, first off, it's important to understand that um, even the Kyoto Protocol of the 90s uh, was bought off by many European leaders, and they began to implement CO2 controls on their industry, and they got into uh, carbon credit trading very early. Uh, Europe, uh, generally a socialist uh, union with the European Union, uh, adopted very quickly uh, any UN report that came out and recommendations from those UN reports. And so they are uh, way ahead of the US, China, India, and other countries in implementing the UN Accords. Many of the people that worked on those science uh, committees, uh, the leading science institutions were in Great Britain, a member of the European Union, uh, much of this got started in Great Britain during the Margaret Thatcher years, and uh, many of the people that end up in the 
United Nations Environmental Development uh, Organization came out of the UK uh, and then Germany and France and so forth uh, did their part. So they were well ahead of us and still are uh, implementing Kyoto Protocols and picking up what they said they would do in the December 2016 um, uh, Paris Accord. I'm sorry, 2015 Paris Accord. So uh, they are vested now. That's the big issue. The U.S. was never fully vested. California, of course, is fully vested in the Paris Accords. But the U.S. government is not. Uh, thank goodness for the conservatives in our government who, who fought this. Uh, but the Europeans, uh, their businesses, their banking, their environmental organizations, uh, they're all on the same sheet of music. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult for them to change. It's going to take a long time for them to change and go back to the reality of good empirical science instead of political science as their motivations. Uh, let me go to a specific issue, which okay. is the one of carbon tax. The carbon credit and carbon tax structure is already going forward in Europe, and to many uh, government entities in, in the European Union, uh, their debt structure, their lackluster growth in economy, makes it very difficult for them uh, to impose taxes. Uh, with this CO2 myth, they've been able to convince many of their people to approve these carbon credit and carbon taxation structures. Um, so now they are wedded to that income stream in their governments. That makes it even more difficult for them to change. Fortunately, uh, we never implemented a carbon credit here. Fortunately, back in 2008 and 2009, the Chicago uh, carbon credit exchange collapsed. Uh, after word got out that the earth was cooling, not warming. Uh, so uh, that all shifted to Europe, and that's where it still uh, resides. Fortunately, the U.S. never bought in to the Kyoto Protocols and especially the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. Just curious, do you know how much that would have cost American taxpayers if we had gone through and stayed in this uh, accord? Yes, there have been a number of estimates. The uh, ultimate estimate is something like $1.4 trillion over a 10-year period would be the cost to the American consumer and taxpayer to implement the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, obviously, our, our economy is still anemic at sure. best. Uh, we are not seeing the kind of growth we should. Uh, we're now a country that's heavily burdened with debt. And uh, so uh, for us to pick up another $1.4 trillion in debt by imposing climate restrictions, uh, that would certainly be onerous, if not deadly, to our economy. Uh, Bear in mind something very important here. Regardless what the Europeans do, in implementing the Paris Accords, if every country implemented the Paris Accords uh, as they agreed to do, it would have very little impact on the climate whatsoever. It's a shame that it took an administration uh, change for this to happen, for our government to pull us out of this treaty. Um, another, I, I think our current government saved this country a bunch of money by doing it's the right thing and more and more evidence has been coming out since 2016 of, you know, like you mentioned earlier, they're fudging numbers. Uh, the data is just simply being cherry picked. And I've had, um, you know, since we started this channel, we get uh, people that ask us questions and they cherry pick from the data. They don't they don't want right. to they don't want to reveal the entire picture of everything. And that's why we right. do a show called The Big Picture, because we want to, everyone to see the entire you know, all the ingredients, not just one factor, so. And that's that's what I like about uh, what you're trying to do. The title that you have, The Grand Solar Minimum, your website says it all. The Grand Solar Minimum is based on uh, cycles that are 100, 200, or more years long. And for the mainstream media, they pretty much have to ignore these grand solar cycles and grand solar minimums and focus on very narrow periods of time when the earth is warming and from that extrapolate up 
and say, well, this is going to wait, this is the way it's going to be for the next hundred years, when in fact we know that it's up and down yes. in a general trend and never a straight line cold or a straight line warm. No. Uh, so yes, uh, the mainstream media and the global warming movement have intentionally cherry-picked the data that they like and ignored the vast amount of data that says climate is driven primarily by the sun. When we talk about how the TSI does change during the maximum and the minimum, and they talk about the average is 0.1% variance during this minimum, how far down in TSI do you think we'll go? Where do you think we'll bottom out? What are your predictions for sunspots through cycle 25, 26, 27? Um, I'm really pleased that you asked about TSI because it's um, total solar irradiance, something all of your listeners need to be aware of. Uh, total solar irradiance is the amount of radiant energy that's delivered on the upper atmosphere of the Earth. And uh, as that varies, so varies the climate on the planet. If uh, we are getting too much solar irradiance, we get hot temperatures, we get high sea levels. If we don't get the right amount of TSI, then the Earth gets colder and sea levels drop. And basically, that's one of the key measurements of which direction our climate is going, is following that TSI, the total solar irradiance. A couple big things to understand about it. Number one, you're right. Between the 11-year solar cycles that we have, we learned about in high school, every 11 years, the sun grows in intensity and energy output, and then it drops off and then it picks back up, back up again. And at the peak of these 11-year cycles, the sun's magnetic field reverses. So these are things we learned in high school. At the bottom of these uh, troughs where the sun's activity is lowest, we do see a, a big drop in the TSI. But this really doesn't affect climate unless you have multiple 11-year cycles showing much lower than normal energy radiation from the sun. Then we have a climate change. And that's what we're looking at in the next uh, cold climate epoch, the Eddy Minimum, it's called, named after Dr. Jack Eddy, uh, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Great scientist, uh, but the next cold or grand solar minimum, named for him, uh, we believe will uh, last for at least 22, maybe 33 years. That's two or three of these 11-year solar cycles. And during that period of time, the Earth will get very cold. Well, that's number two. Number one was the fact that even though we have the dips, they don't amount to much climate variation. But when you combine them, number two, uh, then you get that. That's also reflected in the sunspot count. Uh, when you see sunspot counts that average only 50 sunspots on average at the peak of these 11-year cycles, and you get two of those that are 50 sunspots or less, then you're down into the Dalton class of minimum, and that's where we think we'll be uh, in the next, through the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, the other thing to uh, uh, bear in mind, a third point actually about TSI, is how we measure it. Even though it's measured by satellites typically at the upper atmosphere of the planet, there's a lot of variation there. And the variation comes from the fact that uh, we've used different satellites, uh, eight or nine different satellites in the last, uh, since 1979, to measure this solar irradiance, this TSI. Right now, the source satellite is the number one satellite that we're using and it's running about 1,361 watts per meter squared. Uh, that's about, uh, well, again, this one meter square uh, on the surface of the upper atmosphere. And we see about 1,361 watts. In the previous satellites, though, we saw 1,366 watts. Now, that's important to note. Uh, we can now combine the two groups of satellites, the ones that were at 1366, and the, the new source satellite at 
1361, and we come up with a composite. Bottom line is, what we now know from the TSI studies uh, over the last 30 years is the very slightest change in that TSI reading can mean the difference between the modern warm period that we're in and a little ice age like we had in the Dalton minimum, I'm sorry, the Maunder minimum, 1615 to 1745. In fact, uh, you're probably familiar with the phrase uh, that the Earth uh, it is revolving around the sun in what's called a Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. Actually, we live on a knife's edge in that Goldilocks zone around the sun. What I mean by that is the very smallest change can bring on an ice age. Instead of an average of 1361, if we were at 1360 and stayed that way for 20 years, we would be in the Maunder minimum. That's an unbelievable statement, but that's what history has shown us, that one in 1,361 parts is all that we need to see in a change in the sun's intensity to give us a new little ice age. Well, we think it'll be less than that coming up. Uh, hopefully, uh, it won't be as bad as the little ice age in the Maunder minimum. But it's still going to be very cold dangerously cold for our agriculture industry world, worldwide. But uh, I'm so glad you brought up this matter of TSI. Thank you. I wanted to add real quick to the TSI. I'm glad you mentioned the two different readings. Um, and I've been following the source uh, website myself. And I've noticed just looking back, it goes all the way back, I do believe, to 04, maybe 07. I'm not sure when they started. But since October, we have been sitting at somewhere between uh, 1360.9 and, and lower than that. Nothing below 1360. But I noticed um, the two difference that if you go to the NASA website, they'll show 1365. And then if you go to source, they'll also they'll show a different number at 1360. So I'm glad you touched base on both readings. They do come into a factor at some point. You can use either standard. If you use the 1366 standard of the other eight or nine satellites, their aggregate average, then you have to drop three parts of that lower down to 1363 to get down to the monitor minimum. But if you use the standard of the source satellite at 1361, you only need to drop one watt per meter squared wow. to get down to the monitor minimum. You can use either standard as long as you know which one you're using. Gotcha. This is a great satellite. It's got four different measurement instruments. Um, I, I hope we continue to use the com combined uh, data from the other satellites and the source. The problem we have with a single-use satellite like the source is the fact that there may be uh, uh, changes in the physics of the instruments that are measuring the TSI. And, for example, we've had other satellites whose uh, platinum resistors that were used to measure temperature uh, had gone out of range of, there's an operating range that they uh, exist in, and their, their data went out of the range, which indicated a failure of a component. That's the problem when you rely on one satellite and one instrument because you obviously want to get continuous averaged data and not rely on one data set in one satellite. One of the things I'd like to talk about uh, when we were talking about that fluctuation of TSI, when you were doing your research, as I understand, you were you have researched uh, Eddie's research, yes. there were places around 2009, I believe it was, where there was a variation over two weeks of 0.34%. There was a drop where there was a sunspot going across the base of the sun. Are you familiar with that incident? Yes. Mm -hmm. And okay. there, there are others, for example, when Mercury and Venus transit across the disk of the sun, they also produce a very significant drop in TSI here on Earth. 
Thank you, John. Uh, so as we get increased coronal holes, if you want to talk about the, the history of coronal holes and how they are growing, uh, I would like your opinion on how those coronal holes, because as we know, that's a cool area on the sun. Uh, if we keep getting these cr large coronal holes and increased particles, uh, they're coming in and they're increasing cloud nucleation. That nucleation is creating additional refraction back into space. That refraction in space is dropping the TSI uh, that we're getting here on the planet, which leads me to believe that the increased amount of galactic cosmic rays, you're following that data too, right? right. Uh, okay, so we're, say 16 percent in the middle, the north part of the country, and 19 percent in the northeast in galactic cosmic rays over the last 10 years. So if that continues to escalate like that, and then you take the data from Dr. Kirkby from CERN. Are you following the uh, cloud project there? Yes. Okay, so if you take Kirkby's original work and you put that together and you add all the aerosols created by the right. aircraft, and the aerosols created by the ships and uh, created by humans, then you have even more of this soup that is going to increase the amount of refracted TSI and uh, drop even lower. And we have seen numbers uh, talk about the amount of energy created by CO2 as being 1.5, 1.6 watts of warming, but when you look at the math of what galactic cosmic rays will do uh, with the amount of aerosols and other junk we got up there, you're talking as much as 6 to 8 watts of decrease in TSI. So if you add that all up and you speak to the coronal hole streams and how they can possibly uh, drop the TSI, uh, what are your thoughts to that, John? Could you speak to that? Um, I know that's sort of a long-winded question. Uh, tell me what you think. Uh, your question is actually all-encompassing of a lot of things that are going on with our sun. And let me step back and try to back into your an answer for you. When the sun has, uh, when the sun goes through its cycles, and right now it's at the peak and on the downslope of the 206-year cycle, uh, that cycle. Uh, basically produces a number of measurements, a number of parameters uh, that I follow and others like me follow. Uh, uh, coronal activity, solar wind, uh, cosmic rays, atmospheric nucleation from cosmic rays, cloud cover, uh, aerosol counts, uh, all of these things end up becoming part of the soup of measurements that we all look at to determine is this consistent or not consistent with these solar cycles. Bottom line is they're all very consistent. And let me add one that you did mention, the uh, Danish scientist Dr. Hans Fenmark, who has shown through his research for quite some time, many years, that increased cosmic ray count does end up nucleating cloud cover worldwide. And the more cosmic rays, the more clouds we have, the more clouds we have, the more reflecting of the incoming sunlight we see. And what does that mean? It means we get colder. The more clouds, the colder it gets. The more reflected sunlight that doesn't reach the, sur reach the surface of the Earth, the warmest. Obviously, that goes back off into space reflected from cloud cover. So what we are seeing now, for example, are the largest highest number of cosmic rays hitting our upper atmosphere than we have ever recorded since the satellite era began in 1979. This is striking. Uh, if you look at cosmic ray counts and compare them with the last uh, uh, four or five or six 11-year solar cycles, there's a direct inverse relationship. When the sun is active and reaches the peak, then the cosmic ray count is very low. When the solar activity is low, cosmic ray count is very high. And the reason for that is the solar wind that's coming from the sun and the increased magnetic field of the sun tend to push out 
all of these cosmic rays that are coming into our solar system from uh, the rest of the universe, the rest of the galaxy specifically. And as long as these cosmic rays are being kept out, then we have relatively low cloud cover. But now that the sun is weakening, the solar wind is weak, the ma magnetic field of the sun is weak, uh, these cosmic rays are now coming in at a greater rate, the highest rate we've ever recorded. So this says, according to Dr. Svenmark's work and the work done at CERN, uh, that yes, we should expect to see cloud cover grow, and we should expect to see a colder planet as a result. But again, that's very consistent with the 206-year cycle. That's exactly what we should be seeing right now, leading into the eddy minimum uh, over the next 20 years. And they are all symptomatic of what happens when we have a change in climate. And our hypothesis on that is if you have the exact same amount of TSI and we have the exact same amount of galactic uh, cosmic rays that we had during uh, the Maunder minimum, that increased amount of particulate created by jets, created by ships, created by automobiles, and all the other pollutants and aerosols going into the sky. We believe that if that exact same circumstance were to happen today, as happened then, it could be worse now because of all the additional particulates that are in our atmosphere that is just food for the nucleation of particles to interact with as they travel through our atmosphere and create that cloud nucleation. Well, you're certainly correct that any increase in uh, nucleation aerosols leading to cloud formation would, again, reflect sunlight and make the Earth cooler. Let me add a uh, comment to this uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is the impact on volcanic activity in uh, climate change. About aerosols, that's where you get a great deal of uh, periodic aerosol injection is from major volcanic activity. Go ahead, Jake. Sorry, yeah, actually, that's kind of funny you mentioned that because I was getting ready to shift gears. Um, another part of the grand solar minimum that we really haven't touched base on, done a lot more focusing on the weather and climate and the crop situation, but... There is another aspect to the Grand Solar Minimum, and this is really covered in your latest book, Upheaval. But why do catastrophic earthquakes and volcanoes seem to come at the same time as these solar minimums? Yeah, that's probably one of the great unanswered questions of our era. Uh, you know, we deal with so many questions we read about in the newspapers every day about Russian collusion in the election and other absolutely worthless topics where clearly one of the most important questions we should be asking is why do we get our worst earthquakes and our worst volcanic eruptions during these grand solar minimums or what I call solar hibernations? Um, because that tells us what's going to happen in the future. What we do know from the research very clearly is that we do see the worst earthquakes and worst volcanic eruptions as the sun goes into these deep minimums, these hibernations. When the Earth gets cold, we see these catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The mechanism is still not understood, and there's a reason for that. In the last eight years of the Obama administration, uh, unless you were doing man-made global warming research as a researcher, you didn't get any money to do that research. Everything had to be based on global warming and supporting the myth of global warming. Wow. Otherwise, your university, your science department did not get any government grants. And that's important because uh, uh, my theory for climate change, the relational cycle theory, has proven to be far superior to the greenhouse gas theory in predicting climate variation. Whereas the global warming CO2 community relies on the greenhouse gas theory to produce global warming, Solar activity and the RC theory rely on global cooling. And obviously no one's going to fund global cooling research during the last eight years of the no. Obama administration. Absolutely. Right now, we're seeing a lot of changes back to hard science, back to data, instead of politicized science, models that don't work, 
scare tactics by the environmental community uh, to raise money and to push for political change or something that's not needed. Uh, hopefully, we will see uh, the Trump administration as it matures uh, to start to uh, turn the tide of bad science back to good science. Speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about the history of earthquake activity in the United States over the history of these minimums. Uh, let's talk about the earthquakes that went up through the middle part of the country, you know, through the West Coast to East Coast, actually. And the history of those with the history of these minimums, uh, just discuss how throughout history going back as we see the correlation of these types of catastrophic earthquakes. I think uh, the strongest one was a 9.0, you know, that type of activity. Let's talk about the history of the earthquake versus solar minimum or alongside the solar minimum so people can realize we have a history of this type of earthquake activity in the United States uh, alongside these grand solar minimums. Um, you know, looking at how it was back then versus how it will be going into the future. Well, fortunately, picking up from the last question, we now know that when we go into these solar minimums, we have these uh, waves of catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. That's what history has shown going back thousands of years. Uh, our most recent work, uh, which actually was years of science put together in one book, uh, which you mentioned upheaval. Let me see if I've got this handy. Uh, this book, which was published in uh, December of 2016, documents very clearly uh, this uh, collateral damage from uh, solar minimums and cold climates and earthquakes and volcanic activity. In this book, we go through in detail, show why California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, the central United States, South Carolina, Puerto Rico, all of these areas are going to see catastrophic earthquakes as the sun cuts back on its energy output and goes into a solar minimum. That's what the science says. That's what uh, history has shown repeatedly and so we should start getting prepared for not only a new cold era, but our worst earthquakes and our worst volcanic eruptions that we've seen in over two centuries. And that's all documented in upheaval. Yeah, speaking of upheaval, thank you very much for the copy of that book. A great read so far for me. And I'm starting to understand a lot. This is all coming together for me. I'm, I'm having that aha moment myself right now during uh, my research and everything. And, you know, I also wanted to mention, I didn't mention this in the beginning of our intro, but you hold a pretty high seat for a prediction center at the uh, earthquake and volcanoes. Could you expand a little bit about that for us? I am the CEO of the International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center. Uh, fundamentally, that's a global collaboration of seismologists who have, over the years, many decades in some cases, develop techniques for improving the science of earthquake prediction. Uh, these uh, scientists, uh, the world's best in their field, came to me in late 2011, and they asked uh, for me to put together a company here in the United States to bring together all the best scientists in, in the world uh, in the field of earthquake prediction and seismology. So uh, we did this, we formed the uh, International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center, the IEVPC, in February of 2012. We've since gone through three test phases uh, in the process of trying to develop uh, a fully integrated uh, chronological uh, prediction system. And I'm very pleased to say we've had tremendous success in doing so. Um, so thanks for asking. Uh, the IEVPC, um, uh, we think, will uh, reach a state of acceptance internationally that uh, we're hoping for in the next few years. Sadly, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, we've had the U.S. Geological Service, the number one authority, uh, 
on geology and seismology here in the U.S. Uh, pretty much put their thumb down on groups like ours or anyone else that wants to predict earthquakes. Uh, sadly, for decades now, the uh, establishment science in the U.S. government says that no one can predict earthquakes, even though we've shown that we clearly can, and others have. Yes. Uh, sadly, the science establishment uh, has put up barriers to groups like ours around the world who have shown that we can predict earthquakes. Back to your book, Upheaval, what can be done to prepare for a catastrophic series of earthquakes predicted in your book, Upheaval? Well, the, the good news about that is um, where my previous book, Dark Winter, talked a lot about the science of going into the new cold era, we didn't talk much about preparation. I had many people that came up to me and sent me emails and during presentations would ask how to prepare. So your question is appropriate. So what we did uh, as a team of uh, researchers, we actually put a lot of how to prepare for these catastrophic earthquakes in the book Upheaval. If you, uh, if you look at the, uh, the book, it uh, describes not only the threats that we actually will face and the probabilities of catastrophic earthquakes in California, the central U.S. and the New Madrid Seismic Zone, for example. But we actually say for individuals and families, for businesses, and for government entities, we give in each category uh, a host of steps of preparation that one can go through. So the book, although it has a lot of great science in it, is really written for the average person on the street and is very much directed at how to prepare for these new uh, catastrophic earthquakes that history shows are coming with this next uh, climate change. It is written for everyone to understand. You don't have to have a PhD or a master's to read this book. Right. John, you did a very excellent job in translating mm -hmm. this information so the average person can get this information. Um, I guess my last question I have, um, it's a three-parter. And it goes along the roles of can mankind really do anything about climate change and speak about uh, geoengineering and finally the roles that uh, volcanoes might play in a climate change. Yes, mankind can affect the climate. Uh, but right now, on, only on a very small scale. There have been lots of studies done by me and others uh, with regard to uh, sending large fleets of aircraft uh, around the planet, dumping uh, aluminum powder and barium sulfate powder and, and things of that type. Uh, but you're talking about uh, many years, a great deal of money in the hundreds of billions of dollars just to get any meaningful change. Uh, let me give you a for instance. In the 1991 uh, volcanic eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, it lowered global temperatures dramatically for almost three years. To do the same amount of global cooling, uh, we would have to put up hundreds of aircraft uh, at hundreds of billions of dollars cost to lower the temperature for two or three years. Uh, we simply cannot afford to do that. Most countries on the planet are heavily in debt. Uh, no one has that kind of money to spare. Uh, so I simply don't see uh, the kind of geoengineering that you're talking about happening anytime soon because it's cost prohibitive. Furthermore, all you have to do is wait to the next major volcanic eruption and you're going to have your global cooling produced anyway. Furthermore, all you have to do is wait for the next climate change, which is now coming, and you won't need to do this geoengineering anyway. Geoengineering got its start, of course, as a uh, another scientific myth to try to cool off a planet that's going into hyper-warming caused by mankind's industrial CO2. So it's a myth built upon another myth. It simply isn't going to happen. Uh, 
and uh, it's a boot point anyway, since now that we're heading into the next solar minimum, the planet's going to get very cold. There's no need for geoengineering. Yeah, and I, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because we come from a community where a lot of people believe the government uh, sprays uh, chemicals in our atmosphere on a daily basis. It was really important that you mentioned the cost uh, because you're right, nobody has that kind of money to uh, do a continuous spray. People think that, that the atmosphere is constantly sprayed with you know, chemicals to change the weather. And like you had stated, it would just simply cost way too much money to do such. There's a, there's a very good example of how mankind can affect climate. Uh, there's, there's several very good studies done on this, uh, but they're all regional, they're all local. Uh, one of the best studies done, however, was after the 9-11 terrorist attack. During that uh, period of days, we had no aircraft flying anywhere in the U.S. What we found out from that was that the aerosols being released by normal aircraft exhaust engines were in fact causing a warming effect. Hmm. But it reached a static level. It reached a static level. So when the aircraft stopped flying, the particulate matter dropped because the aircraft exhausts weren't being produced. And we actually saw a cooling trend. But then when the aircraft got back up again, we saw, you know, the level of aircraft uh, uh, aerosols back up, then things returned to normal. There was another study done in India which showed that uh, industrial activity producing uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases did contribute to a cooling in a certain region near India. Uh, but again, it was localized. It was regional at best, certainly not global. The only way that we can show for sure that there's a global impact is when we have a, uh, a major eruption of a volcano in the class of uh, volcano explosivity index six or seven, uh, then we get global climate effects. But for mankind to produce it, uh, again, hundreds of billion dollars of uh, billions of dollars and hundreds of aircraft flying at the same time to equal only what we saw in the Mount Pinatubo eruption, giving us two or three years of cooling, we simply cannot affect the climate and in no way affect it to the degree and the scale that the sun does on a daily basis. Right, right. Hey, uh, John, could you explain the importance of the double peak during this solar cycle and uh, also the importance of the second peak being higher uh, than the first peak? Uh, thank you very much. It's probably a, another question that we should be seeing in the mainstream media, but of course they don't want to talk about it. Uh, the reason they don't want to talk about it is because for any solar scientist who studies uh, climate variation based on the sun, the, uh, the peak of activity in this current 11 year solar cycle, number 24 it's called, solar cycle 24, is truly unique and truly indicative of how controlling the sun is. Basically, in every 11-year solar cycle, you have an up and down, the sun gets active, and then inactive. At the very peak, you don't have a smooth peak. It's always a double peak, and then it drops off into the next cycle. In solar cycle 14, the second of that double peak was the more powerful. And it was based on that that I predicted that 2015 and 16 would see a spike in, in global temperatures because it produced a spike in solar activity. Whenever we look at long-term solar activity, I'm talking over hundreds of years, going back to when we first began looking at the sun's activity and right after the telescope was invented in, uh, or made popular in 1610, we find out that when we have a solar cycle with a very active secondary peak at the top, when you get a small peak and then a larger peak before it drops off, that happens only 
just prior to a major cold era beginning. And that's why this last double peak at the top of the 11-year solar cycle is so important. It's the sun sending us a final message to get prepared for a new cold era. Thank you very much, John. Um, all right, the next thing I wanted to add on was um, with your predictions. Um, I w would like to know, have you reviewed Valentina Zarkova's work? Uh, if you have reviewed that, uh, how do you think that influences your predictions as far as sunspot counts for cycle 25, cycle 26, and cycle 27. Could you share your thoughts on what you think about Valentina uh, Zarkova's work? Dr. Zarkova uh, is at the University of Northumbria in uh, the UK. She and her team uh, came out about a year ago with a study based on the uh, sun's magnetic field and how the uh, magnetic field of the northern and southern hemisphere of the sun are at various times uh, in phase and then at various times out of phase. And what she found out is that when they're uh, out of phase, they cancel each other out to an extent. And during these periods of canceled magnetic field, we have our solar minimums. We have our solar hibernations and the earth gets very cold. This is very uh, profound and great science. Uh, Dr. Zarkova and her team were roundly criticized by the BBC and other mainstream media here in the U.S. for having come up with a very strong scientific theory that counters the man-made global warming theory. But she's absolutely right. If you look at cycle 25, 26, and 27, we believe they will be on the same scale as the Dalton minimum. Dr. Zarkova's research echoes that. Uh, Dr. Abdu Samatov, the leading Russian theorist uh, for this next cold epoch, says something similar. So the prediction for sunspots, to be specific in answering your question, are that the next two cycles, 25 and 26, will see no more than a 50 sunspot average at peak for both of those cycles. That will put us in the category of a Dalton minimum, which is the same level of decline in solar activity that I've been saying for the last 10 years. Uh, Dr. Abdusamatov, on the other hand, and his, some of his Russian colleagues believe that we'll be seeing not 50, but close to zero sunspots, even at the peak of the 11-year solar cycles for 25 and 26, and definitely by 27. If you follow the Russian uh, interpretation of uh, the solar dynamic models that exist, uh, they're saying we will be in a little ice age by solar cycle late 26 and early 27. Hopefully we aren't. I believe we'll be coming out and starting a warm-up in cycle 27. Uh, I haven't given a specific uh, uh, estimate at this point for the number of sunspots, but hopefully it will be back up in the 60, 70, 80 range at peak uh, and be moderately warm, but no way will it be warm like we're going through in the last few years. Okay, and we follow a lot of work uh, coming over from Russia and we do agree with what the Russians are saying. A lot of people do, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. And that is the model that we're looking at. And that with the increased of galactic cosmic rays that are coming in, I think our TSI is going to drop even greater than that, than the Dalton. Here's my only concern uh, with the Russian forecast. The Russian forecast is based on a monitor minimum. So it's important to understand the monitor minimum began, a uh, correction, the monitor minimum was at the very bottom of the Little Ice Age. Uh, the Little Ice Age started in 1350, and the Earth progressively got colder and colder and colder until the 1600s and 1700s, the very bottom of the monitor minimum. And then it started to warm up again, and then it got up uh, in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, it started to cool again, and went into the Dalton minimum. 
but then it's been climbing for 200 years. So the Earth has been absorbing lots of radiant energy and other forms of energy from the sun for 200 years. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think we're, we're not going to be as cold as the Maunder minimum. We've been through 200 years of heating, and it's going to take some time for that to dissipate. It's one of the reasons why I think everyone has been confused over why there's been effectively no growth, but no major change either one way or the other for almost 20 years now in global temperature. Even though we've seen instances of global cooling, and more so in the last 12 months, uh, the fact is the Earth has been heating up for 200 years. It's going to take a lot of decline on the part of the sun uh, to cool off this very hot blue marble uh, revolving around the sun. Indeed, indeed. But uh, you may be right. I mean, the, uh, uh, well, I will tell you this, uh, by the third or fourth year of the start of solar, solar cycle 24, I'm sorry, 25, and I'm talking specifically in years, we're looking at 2023 to 2026. In that period of time, we will know for sure whether we're going into the a very difficult Dalton minimum or the far worse case, a little ice age. We will know fairly soon how cold it's going to be. Actually, that question he, he gave in my answer is a, a very nice summary and a, and a good end point for this discussion because it says, okay, here's what we think is going to happen for the next 20 or 30 years. And uh, it's important to understand that we will know, uh, let's see, we're looking at the bottom of this next cycle at 2019 or 2020. Uh, we'll need three to five years, so 2023, 2025. 20, we will know for sure how cold it will be. Yeah, and you know, you guys were talking about uh, galactic cosmic rays and, and the cloud formation. And I can tell you, it, it's very real. I can see it right now. And we live in the Buffalo, New York area, and we can feel it in the air. We can feel how these uh, particles interact and almost form like a natural air conditioning in our atmosphere but you could feel it there's days up here in buffalo where the temperature says 75 degrees but the wind's blowing and your skin is cold to the touch at 75 you know, 80 degrees outside when the sun is back on its energy output uh there are real effects to that uh plant and animal life are the very first to recognize uh, that that's changing i have had Numerous people in the agriculture industry tell me that crops are simply not growing like they used to, no. maturing as quickly, yielding as much as they used to. Yeah. So, John, I have another question. I know we're getting ready to wrap it up. Uh, on the next three solar cycles, you're thinking they're going to be 14-year cycles based on the history versus 11 year cycle or even something uh, shorter than that. What are your thoughts? I understand. We should see them longer than 11 for sure. Uh, but uh, I'm not as much concerned with the duration as I am the depth of the uh, drop in TSI and the increase in, in cold weather effects. Uh, if we use the 20, the 11 year cycle, you're looking at 30 years. If you use the 13 or 14 year extension from the smaller cycles, which we often see, then you're you're still looking at uh, 26 to 34 years. Still a long period of time to be cold, long period of time to have devastating earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. It's going to be a very challenging period. For mankind. Indeed, it will well, be, John. I really appreciate your all the work you're doing and keeping this very the performance alive. Uh, the Eddy minimum is going to really be a turning point for the civilization of the, the human species. Uh, the more we can get people like you to talk about it, the better prepared we will be. That's it. Uh, and I don't want people to go into this difficult era of catastrophic earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and deep cold periods with food shortages uh, on a totally negative basis. I want people not only to be prepared, 
I want them to thrive. I want them to do well. If you look at every single period in human history, there's been a group of people who did well because they adjusted, they adapted, and they got ready and prepared for what was coming. That's well, exactly and why we, we're here. Uh, we have a guest next week. We've already had him on once, and you know the, the hope is that we get to talk to you again in the mm-hmm. future. But this gentleman that we're having on again... Uh, his name is a Ice Age Farmer, and he is growing himself right now, but he's doing things like the growth of Moringa. I know you've probably heard uh, David from Adapt2030 talk about it, but this guy yes. shares uh, all kinds of useful information, aquaponics, growing. So that's, you know, we, we want to get as many people involved with this conversation. We want experts in sunspots like yourself in volcano and earthquake prediction and then we got guys like Ice Age Farmer who really know what they're mm-hmm. doing when it comes to growing. So um, that's the goal here at the Grand Solar Minimum Channel. And with that, John, thank you very much for thank joining us again, tonight. John. I can't express enough how uh, greatly we appreciate your work and value this time that we had with you tonight. That's going to do it for us tonight, folks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us as well. We'll talk soon. are going to continue to drop. So that's the current status. Uh, right now, we are, if you uh, look at a straight line graph, there's been effectively little to no change in global temperature for 20 years now. Prediction was uh, made in April. I posted that online. And the prediction said two things. It said global temperatures would drop over the uh, next year, uh, which they have done exactly as I predicted. But I also said that uh, the spike in temperatures, which was produced by a spike in solar heating, nothing else but solar heating, uh, was uh, probably going to be the warmest that the human species, our our peoples, will see for probably 400 years. The reason for the 400 years is the 206-year cycle. We're now going up and we're peaking and we're heading down rapidly. Uh, and, and when we come out of this uh, and then head back up and start warming up, it'll be in the 2040s. But even after that, we won't get very warm. So it'll be at least two cycles of 206 years, so 412 years before we see any significant warming again. And quite frankly, that far out, you see other major solar cycles at right. play. Uh, and uh, the analysis isn't done on those. Some people are looking at those cycles, uh, but it could be that uh, even after 400 years, it'll only get much colder. Some are predicting a Monder class minimum. What are your thoughts? Also, what is the time frame to reach that point? And could you expand on the last Monder minimum and how that affected civilization? Uh, right. The uh, first part of your question is how soon and will we get down to a Maunder class solar minimum? Uh, there are many who believe we are heading into a new little ice age, which in terms of the Maunder minimum refers to the period of time when the sun had, had dropped in intensity and was the coldest period of the global warming story. But uh, if you were in uh, Great Britain in February, you would already know that the next cold epoch has begun because all of a sudden you've been told that uh, cold weather has killed much of the vegetable crop and you can't uh, get lettuce or cucumbers in your grocery store. And in fact, there are actually people fighting uh, 
over vegetables in Great Britain grocery stores uh, in February because of the cold weather Europe was getting. So over there, uh, a lot of people may feel uh, that it's already started to hit. Um, uh, on the other side of the planet, uh, uh, the capital of Australia, Canberra, where my director of research for our earthquake uh, research company is, said they just set new cold weather records down in Australia. So uh, it depends on where you live, but certainly here in the U.S. we're still dominated uh, by the media and the government, uh, or at least the previous government, uh, telling us uh, something about the climate that's uh, probably not accurate. Uh, more specifically, uh, to know that the next cold epoch has hit uh, with certainty will come, in fact, when we have that first uh, bitter cold winter that lasts until spring and destroys our uh, food supply to a large percentage. Uh, we did have losses this spring, but uh, the media hasn't discussed uh, much of that. Uh, so uh, the short answer is uh, when things start to disappear in the grocery store and the supermarket uh, because of cold weather damage, then probably people will stand up and say, what's going on? I thought everything was supposed to be getting warmer, not colder. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the media not t communicating. We've done several updates that we have little, you know, two, three minute clips that we show. And a lot of the stuff that we report on is not in the mainstream media. You really have to dig to find some of these, you know, freak hail storms. You talk about South Australia setting cold records. I got an email from a gentleman who lives in New Zealand right now. And I guess they hit minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's pretty cold for them at this point in their winter. They think their winter's five to six weeks earlier than what it's supposed to. So there is evidence of the, what you just said here all over. Your comment about New Zealand, uh, one of the uh, big myths that we keep hearing about is the fact that uh, glaciers all over the planet are shrinking and, and will disappear. Uh, New Zealand's... Uh, I think got 26 major glaciers and they're all growing at the fastest rate they've recorded uh, in the modern satellite era. So again, who knows about that here in the U.S.? No one because the mainstream media won't discuss it. Right, exactly. All right, uh, another question I had for you as well. Uh, what is the current status of the Earth's temperature and can we trust what the government is telling us? Uh, the current status is that we've just come off a peak of warming in the 2015-2016 period. But as I predicted in early 2016, uh, this would be the last such warm spike in global temperatures that we will have probably for the next 400 years. Since uh, early 2016, uh, global temperatures have continued to drop. We had another very steep drop in June from May to June. I believe in May we had an anomaly of 0 0.43 and um, it went to 0 0.26, so a big drop uh, from May to June. And I expect this uh, drop in temperatures to continue and to be essentially unabated until we get to the uh, 2040s. So uh, we'll certainly see ups and downs. Uh, weather uh, and climate uh, do overlap on a yearly basis uh, and every two years. So you will see uh, uh, variations, ups and downs that are quite rapid and, and large. But uh, we're on the downside of the 206-year solar cycle. There's nothing mankind can, can do about it. Uh, we'll just uh, have to uh, recognize that global temperature Everybody, welcome to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us. Retired NASA and NOAA scientist, author of the book Cold Sun, Dark Winter, 
and his latest uh, that was released this last December, Upheaval. John, how you doing tonight? I'm mean, just fine, Jake. Uh, thanks for having me on. John, this has been a long time coming. We were uh, reached out to you uh, weeks ago. We're, we are very excited to have you on our channel. Um, I mentioned in our communication that we consider uh, your work as a foundation and beyond for our channel. We're thrilled to have you here, and it's an honor. Thanks again for being here. Glad to be here. And all right. thank you for all the work you and Laura have been doing. Uh, it's great to see uh, your focus on the next grand solar minimum. I wish there were more people like you and Mari helping get the message out. It's it's growing. I can tell you that the results right now are tremendous. There are more people engaging in our community about this than there was, say, four weeks ago. So, yes, um, yes that that's our main goal here at this channel. We want to work with everybody that's on this topic. Um, okay, so I'd like to ask a few questions here, John. And I know you've probably been asked these quite a bit. Uh, the first one I wanted to ask you was, when will it be obvious that a new cold epoch has arrived as predicted in your book, Dark Winter? Well, actually, it's already obvious to a lot of people on the planet. Uh, regrettably, the uh, media uh, still uh, does not tell what's happening uh, to the extent that they're still pushing the man-made called Little Ice Age. That was uh, 1615 to 1745 specifically. That's the Maunder Minimum. And uh, that was a period of time when uh, New York Harbor froze over and stayed froze over. The Thames River stayed froze over. The Baltic Sea stayed frozen over. Uh, countries, uh, people could go from country to country across the frozen Baltic Sea. And it was so cold and the ice was so thick that they actually built hotels and shops uh, and other facilities out on the ice for travelers that were going back and forth between countries uh, over the frozen Baltic Sea. That's how bitterly cold it was. And of course, during this period of time, we had some of the world's greatest uh, warfare or battles going on. Uh, starvation was common. Uh, uh, famine and plague were common. Uh, illness was everywhere. Life expectancy dropped dramatically. Uh, there are a number of very good books written on this uh, period of time, and I recommend anyone that wants to do so uh, just research uh, the Maunder Minimum and that period of history, uh, especially European history, and you'll see how difficult life was, how crops routinely failed, uh, people starved to death. It was not a good time to be alive. Um, and unfortunately, our Russian colleagues are totally convinced uh, that we are heading into a little ice age again, like we were in the Maunder Minimum from 1615 to 1745. Uh, my, uh, my own research says we are uh, not heading that deep, but it'll be bad enough. We believe we'll be uh, seeing not a Maunder Minimum, but a Dalton Minimum which lasted from 1793 to 1830. That was pretty bad. That was pretty cold. Uh, rampant warfare uh, existed throughout Europe during that period of time. The War of 1812 struck here in the U.S. So uh, there was lots of warfare, lots of famine, lots of death and destruction from the collateral effects of war. 